On this lecture, we're going to summarize the analysis of these problems which we've been carrying along all uh, through the uh, discussion so far. We'll begin with jo Motors versus Jones, and we'll now make use of what we have learned and do a summary analysis and also point out just exactly what you would write in certain places. Now, in this problem, uh, Motors has sued Jones for, uh, in count one, for $15,000. And you are asked whether or not Motors is entitled to that $15,000. Uh, you would begin by saying something like, uh, uh, in order to, uh, Motors has sued Jones for $15,000. In order to prevail, uh, Motors must establish that a contract was formed with Jones, uh, deal with the modification, establish the breach, and establish that it is entitled to these damages because of the breach. Uh, new paragraph. The, uh, the UCC, uh, or the Uniform Commercial Code, applies to this transaction because it is a transaction in goods. Goods are movable personal property, uh, tangible personal property, and a bolts qualify as goods. New paragraph. Was the contract formed? The formation of a contract requires formation of a contract requires that the parties agree on the essential terms consideration and no effective defenses. Uh, here, the parties agreed on the, here, uh, here, on the, did the parties agree on the essential terms according to the facts, or you, you might change that and say, the, uh, the essential terms of a contract are the party's price, subject matter, quantity, and time for performance. Here, according to the facts, the parties agreed on, on the essential terms. The parties are Motors and Jones. The price is 85 cents per pound. The subject matter is uh, specifically described bolts. The quantity is 10,000 pounds per month for 10 months, and the time for performance is beginning March 1st. Uh, therefore, the parties agreed on all of the essential terms. Consideration uh, requires that this is a part of a bargain, and here the bargain is bolts for money, and so the consideration requirement is satisfied. Uh, the uh, defenses, now there are a lot of defenses to the formation of a contract, statute of fraud, fraud, duress, etc. You wouldn't say this. When you got to the no, no effective defenses part, you would say the only uh, possible defense to the formation of this contract is statute of frauds, and according to the facts, the, uh, the uh, contract was in writing, and therefore uh, the statute of frauds has been satisfied. As a result, uh, Motors has established that there was a contract between Motors and Jones. Modification. Uh, the parties attempted to modify the contract. Uh, was the modification effective? Modification requires, notice we're giving a rule and satisfying rules. Modification requires that the parties agree uh, on the new terms. Uh, uh, no consideration is required for a modification in good faith, that's at 2-209, subsection 1, and no effective defenses. Did the parties agree on the new terms? According to the facts, the parties, the new ter the parties agreed on the new term of 90 cents per pound. Um, although no consideration is required, a good faith is required, and according to the facts, Motors was acting in good faith when Motors said he could not do it for 85 cents per pound. Uh, defenses, uh, the modification, uh, the defenses to a modification are the same set, but the only one that matters here is statute of frauds, because there's clearly no fraud, duress, that sort of thing. Uh, the modification was made uh, orally, 
therefore a writing is necessary uh, and, and a writing is necessary because uh, the contract as modified is for the sale of goods for the price of five hundred dollars or more the contract as modified is for the sale of goods for ninety thousand dollars therefore the modification needs to be in writing modification is not in writing no effect I'm, I'm obviously uh, not dictating now the uh, the only possible defense is statute of frauds. This is where you would explain that uh, the statute of, that it is um, it is Motors who deny who is denying the modification. As I said, it is Motors who is denying the modification in order to get the 15 cents per pound damages instead of 10 cents per pound damages. Uh, it is Motors that's denying the modification, and uh, and uh, therefore. Uh, the statute of frauds requires that we that Motors has signed the modification. Motors did not sign. However, uh, uh, the uh, 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 under certain circumstances, Motors' signature is not necessary. Then you would cite 2-209, subsection 2, explain that where the contract is between merchants and one merchant uh, sends a written confirmation to the other, which is received within a reasonable time. Uh, and is sufficient to bind the sending merchant uh, and the receiving merchant has reason to know of the contents and does not object in writing within 10 days of the date of receipt that the receiving merchant is bound even though the receiving merchant did not sign anything. Here, uh, uh, according to the facts, Jones sent a written confirmation to Motors. Uh, it uh, it uh, uh, was received according to the facts. However, the facts do not say it was received within a reasonable time. The facts don't say when it was received, but uh, it must have been received before March 1st because that's when the breach was announced. Or I said sometime before March 1st. So maybe it was received within a reasonable time. Did uh, the uh, did Motors, General Motors, have reason to know of the contents of the confirmation that Jones sent to Motors? And you would point out that they had just made the modification that, uh, uh, earlier, and therefore when Motors receives a, um, uh, a writing from Jones, he has some reason to suspect what it might be because they just negotiated the modification orally. Uh, although, according to the facts, Motors did not uh, read it, but it, he has reason to know of the contents, and according to the facts, he did not reply within 10 days of the date it received. Therefore, Motors will be treated just as though Motors has signed. One other error problem here is that the typed confirmation said 91 cents per pound, but you would point out that 2-201 provides that even though the writing uh, uh, omits a term or contains an error, that that does not prevent the writing from satisfying the statute of frauds. And here the writing has the error of 91 cents. It still satisfies the statute of frauds and the court will simply reform the writing to conform to the intent of the parties. That takes care of your statute of frauds discussion regarding the modification. Then you would go to the breach, uh, and the breach and you would explain that uh, a uh, breach of contract is the non-performance of a contract duty which has become absolute. Um, a, a, a contract duty is absolute when all conditions preceding uh, to the uh, party's duty to perform have occurred or been excused. Time for performance has arrived. This is your regular breach analysis here. All conditions have occurred or been excused. Time for performance has arrived and the duty not discharge. Definition of breach. Here there were no conditions precedent to uh, a, a motor, a Jones's duty to deliver the bolts. The time for performance, uh, uh, we need not wait for time for performance in cases of anticipatory repudiation. And here we have anticipatory repudiation because regarding to the facts, before either party had performed, well, let's back up. The rule is that anticipatory repu uh, breach by anticipatory repudiation occurs where the one party notifies the other before uh, there's been performance on either side that the person, the party will not perform when time arrives. 
Here, there was anticipatory repudiation because, according to the facts, Motors, uh, Jones notified Motors that he wasn't going to perform. So we have, and the duty, Motors' duty to perform was not, pardon me, Jones's duty was not discharged in any way. Therefore, we have a breach by anticipatory repudiation. Now that we have the breach, we look to uh, uh, the damages. And how do you determine damages for breach of contract? Well, that's easy. Let's make some space on the board here and do that. Uh, the, uh, uh, I think I will leave this here and go to the other board. No, that's not going to work. Okay. So, damages. Damages must be actual, causal, foreseeable, and unavoidable. Actual, that's a rule. Actual means that the damages uh, must be actual in amount, meaning not, not too speculative. And here the damages are not speculative, because we're told what, uh, what, how much Modus had to pay for the bolts. Modus paid $1 a pound, and the contract price was 90 cents a pound. Causal, but for the breach, uh, Motors would not have suffered this damage. That's true. Uh, foreseeable. Now, Motors has two damages. Uh, Motors uh, is damaged by the, uh, uh, by not uh, getting the, by having to pay more for the bolts, but Motors also was damaged because Motors has to pay the $600,000 liquidated damages to this company called Electric. But uh, the damages, <coughs> the, the $10,000, and we're going to use, it's going to be 10, not 15, because the modification was effective, and therefore uh, Motors is not entitled to 15000 but only to 10000 But the 10000 was foreseeable, because it is foreseeable that if, a, if Jones doesn't perform, Motors will find the bolts elsewhere and sue for the difference. So the $10,000 was quite foreseeable. Uh, the uh, the $600,000, this is a Hadley versus Baxendale problem, as we talked about. The $600,000 is not foreseeable because according to the facts, Jones did not know and had no reason to know that Motors had this contract with this huge 600 uh, liquidated damages clause in the contract. So therefore, Jones will not have to pay the $600,000. Just to be clear about that, here is Jones in our picture. Here is Motors. And Motors has a contract with Electric. Uh, and this is where the $600,000 liquidated damages occurred between Motors and Electric. But according to the facts, Jones had no knowledge of this contract. Therefore, under Hadley versus Baxendale, uh, Jones does not have to pay the 600000 because it was not foreseeable by Jones at the time the contract was formed. And finally, the duty to mitigate. Uh, according to the facts, I mean, uh, when, when there's been a rule, when there's been a breach of contract, the non-breaching party has a duty to make reasonable efforts to mitigate damages. Uh, here, according to the facts, uh, after uh, Jones notified Motors of the breach. Motors uh, made diligent efforts to find other bolts uh, and finally found some 60 days later at uh, $1 per pound. So Jones did what, J Motors did what Motors could do to mitigate damages, and this has been satisfied. Therefore, since the damages, the $10,000 was actual causal, foreseeable, unavoidable, Jones, Motors is entitled to $10,000, not $15,000. Uh, and also, you would point out that motive that the nine thousand that the nine thousand dollars is based on uh, the typing error and that will not be uh, that will not uh, uh, be significant. So that is the end of the analysis of this question. We're now going to go through the analysis of the buyer seller turbine. We've uh, analyzed it in various various parts of it, but I want to do a quick summary so that you can see the, uh, uh, the, the integrated sort of solution to the problem, how you organize it, 
and what you would say in certain places. So in the buyer-seller buyer turbine problem, uh, first problem is formation. Did buyer and seller form a contract and to answer it? Formation of a contract requires agreement on the central terms, consideration, and no effective defenses. The, uh, uh, the, uh, here, you can get into agreement on the central terms by the offer and acceptance method. And you explain that here, uh, 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 the buyer solicited an offer. Use the words there and show why they solicited an offer. Uh, then seller made an offer. Then buyer rejected uh, the seller's offer uh, with a counter offer. This offer, by the way, by the when the seller made an offer, the price was not included. But 2-305 says that's okay. You can make a valid offer without the price being there. If you agree to agree on it in the future, 2-305. Uh, the buyer rejected that offer by saying, I'll accept it only if you agree that the final price is not to exceed 400000 That's your uh, counter offer. Then the seller said, we assent to that, and so that was the acceptance. So you now have the parties agreeing on the essential terms by the offer and acceptance method with some back and forth going on there. Next was this part of a bargain. Obviously, these people are trading uh, money for a turbine. Defenses to the formation of a contract that are applicable in this problem are the statute of frauds. Uh, the uh, buyer satisfied the statute of frauds because buyer signed the written confirmation that went out the next day. Seller, we satisfied the statute of frauds by the seller by using 2-201 subsection 2, as we've talked about, between merchants. Of course, that means you have to establish that buyer and seller are both merchants. You need to do that. So that completes the formation of the contract. The part buyer and seller have agreed on the essential terms. It is a bargain, and uh, the statute of frauds has been satisfied. So there are no effective defenses. Next uh, comes the written confirmation, and it's a 2-207 issue as well as a statute of frauds issue. In the written confirmation, remember that, first of all, the written confirmation was used to satisfy the statute of frauds. We've just talked about that, and that's settled. But the written confirmation is also uh, has some additional terms in there, and under 2-207, we have to decide what to do about those additional terms. In the written confirmation, there were three new terms, and those three new terms are there was a liquidated damages clause in the written confirmation, there was a provision that all the usual warranties apply, and there was also a provision that all changes must be in writing. Now, 2-207 uh, uh, says that if uh, you accept, if, I, if you make me an offer, and if I accept, and, uh, I ex accept the offer and I add some proposal for additional terms in my acceptance, okay, that it's still a good acceptance. And there's a problem of what to do with the addition, with the proposal for additional terms that I put in there. Now, mind you, this is different than if I say, uh, I accept only on the condition that you do so and so. That's a rejection and counteroffer. But if I say, I accept, but I propose that you do so, and I would like you, would you please, it would be a great idea if you did, and so forth. All that mushy stuff in there. What happens to that mushy stuff? And the answer is that you've got a contract on the, on the basic terms. And the, as to the mushy stuff, the deal is that if either of us is a non-merchant, it disappears. If we are both merchants, then the mushy stuff gets added to the terms of the contract, uh, provided they do not materially alter or I don't uh, object within a reasonable time. Now, as to uh, uh, whether or not the mushy stuff materially alters the contract. Well, in this case, I, there was a liquidated damages clause, which is added, and there's a, an, uh, uh, the, the warranty and the written changes. As to the liquidated damages clause, you obviously needed to make an argument that this might be a material change. And you look for things like surprise. Uh, is it one-sided? Uh, and in the case of liquidated damages clause, Maybe these people have, we don't know if this is a surprise to the builder or not. Uh, it is one-sided in the sense that 
uh, uh, only the uh, 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 buyer benefits from the liquidated damages clause. So uh, make an argument here. There are points allocated here. You must, right here at this point, you must make a significant argument as to whether or not the liquidated damages clause is a material change. If, it's not, if it is a material change, it would be excluded. If it is not a material change, then it will be included. As to items two and three that were in, uh, included in the written confirmation that uh, the usual warranties apply, well, you can see that usual warranties means that this was not a surprise to anyone, and so that probably will not be treated as a material change, and therefore it will be included in the contract between buyer and seller. And then uh, the provision that was added in the written confirmation which says all uh, changes must be in writing, that is certainly not a material change, it's not a surprise, it's a good idea, it's a major contract, you need to keep things in writing. And so the, that will not be treated as a material change because it's not one-sided, it is not, it is not necessarily a surprise. Uh, so that's how we would deal with 2-207 and then, so we now are at the point in the buyer-seller uh, turbine problem where the parties have formed a contract over here, they successfully formed a contract, uh, they have, uh, there's a, uh, it's in writing, Satisfaction frauds have been satisfied, there's a written confirmation that attempts to add three more terms, two of those terms will be added because it's between merchants, the third one is debatable, the liquidated damages clause one is debatable. So we now come to the modification. Uh, buyer and seller, uh, 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 seller called buyer and wanted a one month delay. The parties agreed on the one, that is the formation of a modification, pardon me. To modify a contract requires the parties agree on the essential terms, does not require consideration, does require good faith, no effective defenses. The first of these, did the parties agree on the proposed one month delay? Yes, the parties agreed. Do you need consideration? No. 2-209 subsection 2 says they, uh, you do not need consideration for the modification of the contract under the UCC, but you do need good faith. And do we have good faith? Well, we learn later on that when seller called and said, may I have another month, that that was in bad faith. It was in bad faith because uh, the, uh, the seller knew that what seller was really doing was uh, they had practically completed buyer's turbine and seller wanted to sell it to somebody else to make the extra $30,000 profit and surely did not tell buyer that on the phone because buyer had already said that my timing is very, very important. So we have bad faith and that's a reason for the modif one reason for the modification to fail. Next, uh, any effective defenses, other effective defenses to the modification? Well, yes. The terms of the contract itself say that all changes must be in writing. This one's not in writing. Secondly, uh, 2 201 subsection, uh, pardon me, 2 201, th this is a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a modification, the contract, what I meant to write here is 2 209 uh, subsection 3. 2-209 subsection 3 says that if the contract as modified is for the sale of goods for $500 or more, the modification must be in writing. And here the contract as modified is still for the turbine, it's just a different delivery date. So the statute of frauds requires that that modification be in writing. And thirdly, that a defense to the formation of the modification is just plain fraud. Bad faith and fraud both. And so we've got fraud here. So for all these reasons, the modification is not effective. If the modification is not effective, then uh, on, and there was non-performance by February the 15th, then there was a breach on February 15th, and buyer seeks remedies for that breach, damages, and specific performance. Damages, $5,000 liquidated damages. If the liquidated damages is, is both included and valid, that is to say, the liquidated damages clause won't even be in the contract if it's a material alteration. But if it's not a material alteration and it's included, then you've got to look and decide, is the liquidated damages clause valid? And if it is valid, then buyer's entitled to $5,000 uh, of the liquidated damages clause. Remember, a liquidated damages clause is valid when 
the, at the time the contract was formed, the parties realized at that time that if there's a breach later on, they will not be able to easily determine what the damages are. So they negotiate a deal on the damages right now uh, uh, at the time the contract is formed. And that's what this liquidated damages clause, does. is it satisfy those requirements? Well, the builder will say, look, if you're, if you're late in, in delivering the turbine, that I have my, my uh, expenses, my, in, uh, you know, my schedule here in building this power plant is such that it'd be very hard for me to figure out what the real damages are, so let's put in a liquidated damages clause. So it might be valid for that reason. Is this $1,000 a day a good faith effort uh, of the buyer to determine what the real damages were? Well, we don't know, but you need to say that. So for a liquidated damages clause to be valid, it takes two requirements. One, it's a kind of the parties realize at the time the contract was formed that if there is a breach later on, they'll have trouble figuring out the damages, so they decide to negotiate them now. And the second requirement is that what they negotiate now is a good faith attempt to determine what the real damages are, not some kind of a penalty clause. So uh, that's what you'd say about damages. And finally, buyer wants the, the uh, turbine itself, not the money damages so much. They want, in this case, they get the money damages and the, and the turbine. Uh, and the, to get specific performance, the requirements are inadequate remnant law, definite terms of the contract, feasible to enforce, mutuality, and defenses. And the uh, inadequate remnant law, you need to discuss here why the builder's remnant law, the money damages of $1,000 a day, is really quite inadequate. And uh, the, uh, so you discuss a lot of points tied up there. Other than that, uh, all the other requirements for a specific performance are easily satisfied because the terms are quite definite, just deliver the turbine. It's feasible to enforce, make them deliver it, pay them for it. This says make them pay for it if they're going to deliver it, and there are no defenses. Uh, the buyer is the one who wants the uh, turbine, and the buyer has not acted in bad faith or, or, or unclean hands or anything of that sort. So that is, I wanted you to see the overall uh, uh, structure sort of from beginning to finish of the analysis of the turbine problem, and that's how you would uh, analyze it, and that is the end of the analysis of this problem. On this lecture, we're going to do a quick review of Owens versus Carter. Again, we've looked at many of the parts of it already, but I want you to see the flow of the complete analysis. In this problem, Uh, Owens is a homeowner, Carter is a contractor, and Carter and Owens con contracted for Carter to build this garage. The garage was to be 25 feet long, 30 feet wide, and there was to be a wall, an interior wall, four feet from the rear wall in order to have storage space there. Now, and they formed the contract, and we really didn't have any problem with the formation of the contract. In the contract, uh, it said that the siding on the garage was to be matched to the siding in the house. It said that the paint on the garage was to match the paint on the house, and that the roof on the garage was to match the roof on the house. And so they formed the contract. It also said that uh, the contract said time was of the essence. Let's put that on here. It said time of the essence. And it was to be completed uh, on uh, April, uh, uh, completed by April 30th. So those were the terms of the contract, and so uh, what happened uh, in performance is that the builder, first of all, finished 10 days late. Secondly, this wall, which was supposed to be four feet from the rear, was six feet from the rear, so the garage wasn't long enough for the car to fit in and close the doors. So that's the second thing that went wrong. First thing was late performance, 10 days. Secondly, the wall, the interior wall was in the wrong place. 
And the third problem is that the shingles on the roof of the garage did not perfectly match the shingles on the roof of the house, although they were close and of higher quality. And this happened because the contractor said it was difficult, but not impossible, to find matching shingles. And so the contractor obtained some shingles which were of even higher quality, but did not perfectly match the shingles in the house. Close, but not quite. And so that's the other breach that the owner will claim. So now the owner has not paid Carter, and uh, Carter, of course, is the one who is going to bring the lawsuit. So Carter is going to sue owner for non-payment. Uh, the, the cost of the complete job was $8,500. Now the analysis would proceed as follows. Carter is suing Owen for non-payment of the garage job. He would point out, first of all, that uh, Carter will claim that a contract was formed and that Owen breached it. And therefore, Carter is entitled to damages for the breach, $8,500. Carter will say the common law applies to this contract uh, transaction because it is a contract for services. Uh, Carter will have to establish that Carter and Owen had a contract, but that is given to us. Thirdly, you do not need to mention this, but I want you to see how this fits from the general structure, that there were no interpretation problems or clarification of the terms. There's no parole evidence problem. There's no ambiguity. There's no mistake. You need not say anything about it at all. There is also no changes in the contract, such as no modification. You need not mention that at all either. But Carter is alleging that Owen breached and that Owen's breach is failure to pay him the $8,500 for the job. Uh, to establish breach, uh, Carter must establish three things. That all conditions preceding to Owen's duty to pay Carter have either occurred or been excused. Carter also has to establish that the time for performance, the time for Owen to pay him has arrived. And finally, Carter, uh, if, Owen, if uh, Owen claims that his duty to pay Carter has already been discharged, it has not, but he would make that claim. So uh, Carter, Carter has to prove all conditions proceed and have occurred have been excused, time for Owen's performance has arrived, and that Owen's duty has not been discharged. Have uh, the condition, what are the conditions preceding to Owen's duty to pay Carter? They are that Carter build according to specs, and that did not occur. And therefore, we look to see if Carter's duties have been excused, excused by substantial performance primarily. The places where there was a defect in the performance, we need to look at those places and see if there has been substantial performance. First, there was late performance by 10 days. Secondly, the roof did not match the, sh the shingles on the roof, did not match the shingles on the house, and the storage wall was uh, two feet uh, uh, too far forward from the back wall. Let's begin with the late performance. Carter, pardon me, Owen will say you were supposed to perform by April the 30th, and uh, time was of an essence. I put time is of the essence in the contract. You did not finish on time. That's a material breach. I won't pay you anything. Well, first of all, the time is of the essence provision, which is in the contract, will not be enforced. Time is of the essence provisions means, of course, that time really is of the essence, and if the person uh, doesn't finish on time, that's a material breach, not a minor breach. Like most late performances are just minor breaches. So that's a material breach. Now, in these uh, common law contracts, when you say time is of the essence, it is enforced only, only, if time really is of the essence. That is to say, there's some reason as to some real, real reason as to why the contract must be completed at the time that's stated. Uh, for example, my house is uh, going to be used to make a movie beginning on September the 1st. And I hire a painter because the movie people want my house to be blue. So I hire a painter to paint it blue, and I explain to the painter, you've got to be in, out of here and your scaffolding gone 
by September the 1st, and I give them the reasons. And now, uh, time is of the essence, and if that person does not finish on time, that is a material breach. But here, Carter's getting a garage built onto his house in the summertime in April. And so there's no, uh, there's nothing about this contract for which time is of the essence. So the time is of the essence clause will not be enforced. And what happened then is that Carter finished 10 days late. That is substantial performance. And when there is substantial performance, the rule is that uh, uh, Car uh, Owen has to pay Carter the contract price minus whatever damages occurred because of the minor breach. When there's been substantial performance, if I have only substantially performed, not fully performed, then I have committed a minor breach, and you're entitled to damages for the minor breach. And what happens is that you pay me the contract price, but hold back the damages which occurred because of the minor breach, and that's what happened here on the late performance. Uh, Owen would pay Carter the contract price minus whatever damages he could justify for 10 days late. Not very much, maybe a dollar or two. Secondly, the storage wall. Now, the storage wall was not in the proper place. You recall over here on the other picture, you see where the storage wall ended up here, instead of, uh, which is six feet away from the rear wall, as opposed to here, which is only four feet away from the rear wall. It's to, six o'clock. So to remove this uh, wall and put it back where it belongs, cost $800, and so now the question is, has Owens, has Carter still substantially performed, even though this is a problem? Well, we need to look more carefully at what it is that constitutes substantial performance so we can decide whether or not what uh, Carter has done, placing the wall in the wrong place, is that still substantial performance? Well, let's take a look at some of the details of substantial performance. Substantial performance is very important. The place where it occurs is that it is an excuse of the condition of actual performance. That is to say, if I am to perform for you and you are to pay me, a condition preceding to your duty to pay me is that I actually, that I perform. And if I have substantially performed but not fully performed, then you still have to pay me the contract price but hold back the damages. So uh, in substantial performance, how do you decide whether or not what I have done amounts to substantial performance? There are two rules you can use. The general rule is uh, you ask the question, did the defendant's performance meet the essential purpose of the contract? That's basically what you're trying to decide. And if it's clear that it did, you can use this standard. If you need some more details in order to do uh, analysis and to get some more points, Use these six factors from Restatement 237. These six factors say, number one, you, the extent to which the defendant has already performed is a factor. Was the breach willful or negligent or innocent? That's another factor. Third factor, the uncertainty that the defendant will complete the job is a factor. A fourth factor, will dollars compensate the injured party? Number five, did I get together number five, how much of a benefit uh, has the uh, plaintiff already received? If they've got most of the benefit of their bargain, that's a factor. And finally, how much of a hardship is going to be imposed on the defendant if you call this a uh, material breach rather than a minor breach? So these are the factors you'd use to analyze uh, unless it's very clear. In our case, <coughs> we can we say was uh, uh, the storage wall is a minor breach because uh, the uh, did the defendant performance meet the the essential purpose of the contract? Well, you could say no because the garage owner can't put the car in there; it won't fit. Uh, however, uh, if you do some analysis, some details, the extent to which the defendant has already performed. Well, the garage has been fully built. It's just this wall that's out of the way, that's wrong. Will the breach be, was the breach willful, apparently? I don't know. There's no facts, and so we can't say it's willful. The uncertainty that the defendant will complete, we don't know anything about that. Uh, will dollars compensate? Sure, dollars will compensate the homeowner. 
because by holding back money, the homeowner can get somebody else to replace, to remove the wall and put it where it belongs. How much of the benefit of the bargain did the plaintiff receive? Well, the plaintiff has got a garage finished. It's just a wall that needs to be moved. And so he's gotten a lot of the benefit of his bargain. And hardship, if you call this a material breach, then the uh, contractor can probably still get quasi-contract, but no profit. And uh, how much of a hardship is that? Well, uh, not that much. It doesn't matter what you call it. The main thing is that you explain that if this is treated as a material breach, the contractor can still get quasi-contract, but will not get the contract price. Uh, and whereas if you treat it as a minor breach, the contractor will get the contract price minus what it takes to uh, fix the wall, remove the wall. So whether or not the wall was moving the was the putting the wall in the wrong place a minor breach or a material breach, I think it's a minor breach because of all these reasons we talked about. Finally, the last thing that went wrong is that the roof uh, shingles did not match. The roof shingles did not match, and that is going to cost a lot of money, a couple of thousand dollars to replace those. Do we? And, uh, so the first problem here is, uh, did the roof shingles match enough? Remember that the shingles were close but not perfect. And so how perfect do they have to be to be called matched? Because in the contract, it said that the roof shingles and the house shingles were to match. And the rule is that if this is not fancy taste, then uh, what people mean by matched is uh, what the industry considers acceptable. If, again, if I, am paint, if I dent the fender on my car and I get it repaired and they paint the fender, I want it to match the rest of the car. Well, how perfectly is that match have to be to be called matched? And you go to the standards of the industry, and that's what matched is. On the other hand, if I made some very, very special requirements with the painter, saying this has got to be matched to some incredible degree of perfection because of some reason, and I want you to do that, and the person bids to do just that, then it's got to be matched to that extent. But if I just say match, industry standards will be used. Now here, the homeowner, uh, in building the, in adding, putting the new garage and shingles on the garage, said to the contractor that the new shingles are to match the old shingles. And so that seems like industry standards, and that's probably what would be applied. And so it's a question of whether or not the shingles which were actually used are matched by industry standards. Now, mind you that uh, you can make the argument, and you should make the argument in your answer, you can make the argument that uh, uh, the way your house looks from the outside is a question of fancy taste. And you want the paint and the, sh and the siding to match, and you want <coughs> the shingles on the roofs of the garage and the house to match because it affects the general appearance of the house from the outside. And that it should have been understood by the painter, by the contractor, that this was fancy taste. And that it really had to match, not, not uh, close. Uh, if you make that argument, if you think you can prevail on that argument, then the shingles did not match perfectly, and uh, now it's a question of uh, if the shingles don't match perfectly, it's, it, it, it's a material breach if they were supposed to match perfectly. The, um, normally, if you want something to match that closely, you have to be very specific with the contractor so the contractor understands that this is more than just industry standards. You want a higher degree of perfection. If you want that higher degree of perfection, you've got to make it clear at the beginning, otherwise it's unfair to the contractor. You make it clear at the beginning, and then you can hold them to those standards. I don't think that level of clarity was here, although it's debatable, and therefore I think that the shingles probably matched enough, well enough, and that the homeowner has to pay. You can go either way on the analysis of that. So in general, to summarize then, what we have is a, a common law problem you tell the bar examiners it's a common law problem. In this case, the formation was given. You did not need to mention parole evidence, rule, ambiguity, mistake, or modification, because none of that happened. You do have a breach, and the first element on the breach is that all conditions preceding to the Owens duty to pay must have occurred or been excused. Second one is time for performance has arrived. Third, duty has not been discharged. Here the problems are whether or not the conditions preceding to Owens duty to pay have occurred or been excused, they have not occurred, but have the conditions preceding to Owen's duty to pay been excused by substantial performance? In the case of the 10 days late performance, we say yes, 
substantial performance has occurred. In the case of the wall that needs to be moved two feet, yes, substantial performance has occurred. In case of the roof not matching perfectly, it's debatable. It depends on what the standards were. And I think without saying uh, uh, more, it's hard to tell whether the standards were the fancy taste standards or just kind of the industrial standards, uh, uh, the custom in the community. That, that might be the same, too, by the way. So uh, that is how you would do the analysis. You, and once you have completed uh, establishing that uh, there, was a, there was performance, there were some minor breaches, then the amount of money which Owen, which Cart, Owen, which Owen must pay Carter is the $8,500 contract price minus the cost that it takes to correct these things. Minus the damages for a 10 days delay, that's not going to be very much. Minus about $800 to fix the wall and the roof. Uh, you, uh, uh, we don't know. You can argue both ways. One other way you can argue that you need to mention regarding the roof is that ripping off that roof costs so much money that this may be economic waste to have the contractor rip that off unless it's, you know, the fancy taste is so pronounced that it really defeats a person's expectations in a big way. But otherwise, having them remove all that shingling might be economic waste. If it is economic waste, then what you do is you look at the value, the difference in the value of the house. How much would this house be worth if the shingles on the garage and the house match? And how much is it now worth? How much less is it worth because the, the contractor used the wrong shingles? And it's that difference in value that the contractor would be re required to pay. Uh, that, uh, not, but unless it's less than $2,200. In other words, if, the, if it's cheaper for the contract, if the contractor is liable for not using the right shingles, then uh, your contractor can either pay the $2,200 for somebody else to replace them, or if the owner's value in the house only was diminished by, say, $1,000, then uh, some jurisdictions would give the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the contractor would just have to pay the $1,000 difference. That is the end of the analysis of this problem.